Hey everyone! So, it's about that time of year where it's just constantly dark and wet and cold outside, so uh, let's carry on with our indoor project. Because there is still a ton of things that we need to fix and things we need to service and a whole bunch of reassembly that has to be done on this little 421 Unimog. So the last time you saw this, I had just gotten some paint on it and started putting a few things back together. And not a whole lot has happened since then. But I have been out getting a bunch of the parts that I needed for this so we can carry on. So let's get this up in the air and get those wheels off so we can start putting parts back on this. Okay, so I've already gone and removed that tie rod between the two front hubs that had a bad ball joint on it. That's also why we have some slightly excessive toe angle here. But of course the end that was bad was the one on the fixed end, so I had to go and get a complete tie rod. Now when you go and replace parts like that, ideally you would want to get it aligned. But on this it's actually very crude and basic because on the tie rod normally you would have a threaded insert on this adjustable end and you could use that to adjust it very precisely but this doesn't have that and since the ball joint has to be pointing the same direction as the other one you can really only adjust this one full turn at a time and with the thread pitch on this that's going to move it in and out by one and a half millimeters and that's actually quite a lot in terms of alignment. So really the best I can do is just measure out the old one, get this one as close as possible as I can, and that's just gonna be it for alignment. So a few people have been asking about this thing, what it is, if it's the power steering, and if so, how it works. And uh, I guess that now that we're doing this, I can just do a quick little show and tell. So the 421s did not have power steering as standard. And actually the uh, red one that I have don't have it, so let's just have a quick look at that for a comparison. So on this one, 
We just have a link directly from the uh, pitman arm on the steering gear that runs right down to the swing arm on the swivel. And also there is nothing mounted on this spring console. You'll see that there is on the other one. But this is just the standard setup. Now, power steering was an optional extra, but uh, on newer or bigger vehicles, it would be built directly into the steering gear up here. That's also the case for newer Unimox. But that also means that this whole unit becomes much bigger, and there's already not a whole lot of room in this corner on these Unimox. So that's probably one of the reasons they went with this option. And this was actually a fairly common way to do after mounted or after market power steering on things like this and also tractors that already had a hydraulic system that you could hook into. So really the only structural thing you had to change to fit a kit like this was that you needed another mounting point. This just had to be a solid point somewhere on the axle that's going to function as the anchoring point for one end of that hydraulic cylinder. So the cylinder just mounts into the fixed point over here. And into the swing arm on the swivel over here. And then the link from the pitman arm up here on the steering gear, instead of running to the swing arm over here, it runs to this joint in here. So it's going to be mounting on there like that. Now this is actually not a ball joint. It does have some give in it, but that's because this is actually the valve that opens and closes the hydraulic pressure in that cylinder. So when you turn to the right, for instance, it's going to be pushing over this valve, letting pressure into the cylinder. And because the other end is fixed in place, the whole thing is just going to be pushing out, moving the swivel out with it. And same, of course, if you turn the other way, it's going to be putting pressure in the other chamber of the cylinder, causing it to retract and pull the entire thing in again. This setup also comes with built-in fail-safe, because even if your hydraulics are leaking or not connected like they are now, you can still move the whole thing in and out. You will just be pushing it on this valve instead of the swing arm itself. And same goes if your pump has just died and you still have pressure in it, you're still going to be opening and closing this valve, allowing the fluid to flow from one chamber to the other, so you'll still be able to steer no matter what. So this is actually a really cool and simple way to add power steering to these old vehicles that otherwise didn't have it. And it's actually really strong as well because it is essentially just one big hydraulic cylinder pushing the whole thing back and forth. But it does have some downsides as well, of course, because with it being a big cylinder like this, it is really slow because that little power steering pump has to fill up the big chambers down here. So it's not really suited for faster going vehicles that has to do more maneuvering. And also on an off-road vehicle like this, it's very exposed being down here on the axle. It's actually lower than the axle itself. So it does remove some ground clearance. And if you're about to hit like a big tree stump or boulder or something, you're gonna be smashing up all of this stuff. But enough about the steering, let's get some more parts bolted onto this. And actually let's start at the tank, because I know the sending unit wasn't working, but this is of course the tank that I took from the other 421, but I tried getting this little nut off the terminal here, and it's just spinning the whole thing. So I know that like many of us, this is broken on the inside, so I'm just gonna put a new one in here right away, so I don't have to deal with that later.
Right. So this will only fit in one spot because the holes are not equally spaced out. And uh, that would be this spot. But if I put it there, the arm with the float on is going to be pointing that way. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's obviously not room for that. So something's not right here. Right, so I just realized the one that I bought is for the 90 liter tank and I have the 120 liter tank. And on the 90 liter, it's located in a different spot and that's why this is also turned 90 degrees relative to the one that was actually in here. But it is gonna take me several weeks to get a new one and the holidays are coming up, so that's gonna take even longer. So uh, I'm just gonna make this one work because I'm not really bothered to wait for a new one. And really they are mostly identical. The top part is identical. It just needs to be turned 90 degrees and this one should work just fine. Now this one is also a little bit longer, but that extra bit of length doesn't really matter because this one has more movement on the arm, so it will still reach both the bottom and the top of the tank just fine. So uh, yeah, let's just go ahead and move this over, turn it 90 degrees, and this thing should work just fine. And just like that. Now we have this thing turned the way it's supposed to be. At least for this tank. I am gonna be painting this later on when it is mounted, but it's just too cold for that right now. <laughs> nice. As if it was meant to be.
Now I did only get new shocks for the rear end because somehow the ones up in the front, they were actually all right. So uh, they've just been cleaned up and painted and they're ready to go again. So I also went and got some new rubber boots for these big joints up here. And by the way, yes, I did just paint right over the grease in there. That's really the easiest way to do that instead of trying to mask the whole thing off. And it doesn't hurt anything either because as you pump some new grease in there, it's just going to push all that painted stuff out. But actually, we can just talk about this setup for a little bit because this is actually one of those things that is very special about the Unimox. So when you look at the axles of these, you don't have any control arms. There is nothing that is actually connecting the axles directly to the frame. Typically on a solid axle like this, you would have a lower control arm somewhere that would go up and hook onto the frame. And either that would be set up in a way that would limit the axles movement so it wouldn't tilt, or you would have an extra set of control arms on top of the axle housing that would also connect to the frame to avoid tilting the axle. But this doesn't have any of that. And of course, if it had leaf springs, the leaf springs themselves would be used as a form of control arm. Now you do have those bars right there, but they just connect to that tube right there. And all they do is just strengthen this whole axle so that if you're up on just one wheel pulling the whole thing, you don't get a massive load on this connection down here. This just helps to stabilize the whole thing. And also in the back, you do still have this arm right here. This is still necessary. It controls the side to side movement. If this wasn't here, then the whole axle would just be driving out to one side or the other. But this doesn't actually limit the up and down motion of the axle in any way. So all this means that the whole axle is essentially just sort of free floating underneath the frame. And because this is really just a big ball joint, it can just tilt and move up and down however it wants, completely regardless of whatever the frame is doing. And also all of the pushing and pulling forces from the axle, none of that is going directly into the frame. It's going up along these, some call them torque tubes, some call them drive shaft tubes. I couldn't really say what the correct name is. Torque tube makes sense because really you are transferring all the torque of the vehicle in this axle and into the gearbox housing. This connection for the rear axle and that connection for the front axle. So up here, it's going to be pulling along on the gearbox and back there, it's going to be pushing the gearbox and the entire gearbox is just held on with one, two, three bolts onto this cross member. Those three bolts are the only thing that is connecting the entire drive line to the chassis and the rest of the vehicle. That's actually really impressive. And another little interesting side note to that is since the gearbox is connected to this cross member, that means the gearbox and engine are constantly going to have the same orientation as this cross member. So when the whole thing is twisting, the engine is going to stay in the same orientation as this. So up here in the front, the only other mount for the whole thing is this, where the whole engine can pivot on. And you actually have limiting bolts right here that will touch against the side of this mount. If you didn't have that, then the whole engine could just move over so much that it would start touching the cab. And having this setup is also one of those things that allows the frame to just twist and move as much as it does. Because there is nothing down here that is limiting that movement. The axle can just do whatever it wants and the frame can do whatever it wants. There is no control arms that have to align. There is no sway bars that are limiting things. And also you don't have any low hanging drive shafts that are exposed because they are running inside this tube. So everything is just nicely protected and tucked up well under the vehicle. 
anyway, let's get these things on here. So originally, these are actually just one closed piece. And that means that if you had to get this on, you would actually have to unclamp this whole thing and move the entire axle, disassemble all of that to get the entire axle off. So you could put this rubber boot over the axle too, and then put it back together and put this in place. But luckily the ones that you can buy are open on one side and they're just gonna be clamped together with bolts and a couple of big hose clamps on either end. That makes it a lot easier to install. So with this type of boot that has an opening that you bolt together, we want that part to be where there is the least amount of movement. So on this axle, this tube is gonna be mostly moving up and down. So we want this part to be out on one of the sides. It doesn't really matter which side, but if we have it on the top, it's gonna try and pull on this connection. And if we have it on the bottom, it's gonna be pushing on it. And because there's a lot more rubber in here on this bolted part, it doesn't really have all that much movement in it. We want the movement to be out here where it's flexible. Okay, so uh, this front boot up here, that really gave me quite a few issues. And it's because there's a lot more angle involved here. You can see the whole engine is sort of tilted backwards along with the transmission. And then this front axle tube is tilted the other way. So there's a lot more bend in this joint here. So it kept slipping off the edge. So uh, the easiest thing would have been to put these on before I put the springs in because then I could have brought the whole axle up and made this a lot more straight. But I didn't have those at the time, so uh, instead I did the reasonable thing and just cheated and put a whole bunch of weight in the front of this to compress those springs, straighten this up and get that on there. It worked well enough, so now we got both of these done as well. All right, people, so some have been asking for a little bit more detail and explanation. So I do try and throw that in as I'm putting this back together, but that does mean it takes a little bit longer to film some of these things and I can't fit nearly as many different things into these videos. This one is already getting too long. So I'm gonna end this one here, but I do want to once again, thank all of you guys for following along on this project. It really makes it a lot more fun. So I wish you all happy holidays and I hope you will have a fantastic new year. We'll see ya.